everybody welcome to this latest episode of real talk with rick on this episode i have the uh, bring in the chief executive officer executive director of the metropolitan airports commission so as most of you probably know we have an airport here in eden prairie the flying cloud airport it is a reliever airport of the metropolitan airport commission's overall system they're main base obviously is the MSP airport but they have several reliever airports that they run and manage and Flying Cloud Airport Eden Prairie is one of those and the uh, as the CEO of the organization Brian obviously Brian Ricks who is in for the conversation obviously has a a pretty um, is well regarded and has a really good understanding of the overall operations of the entire system as well as the airport here in Eden Prairie. So he talks a little bit about um, Flying Cloud Airport, how Flying Flying Cloud fits into the overall system, obviously the balance that everyone tries to achieve with the residents that live near the airport and the people that use the airport on a regular basis. We also talk about um, you know, where he spends most of his time and he works from the MSP airport, the main airport in Minneapolis, and some of the trends that we're seeing in aviation. And I also ask him some questions uh, related to his experience with travel himself. So here is my conversation with Brian Ricks, CEO of the Metropolitan airports commission brian ricks uh, ceo of the metropolitan airports commission thank you for coming in and talking today we appreciate it great to be here yeah, yeah thank great, you always great to be in eden prairie nice so um we're just gonna i'm just gonna start out right away with asking you um wh- what is mac what does mac do and what what does the ceo of mac do so MAC, the Metropolitan Airports Commission, so we're, we own and operate the Minneapolis-St. Paul and then a system of six reliever airports. And what's interesting is we are the largest airport system operated by one operator in the country. So that's pretty special for our state. And what I tell people is we were established back in 1943 by the governor and the legislature and when you think back that far, you think about the foresight that went into the thinking that we should have an autonomous group of individuals, an airport commission in this matter, be focused on ensuring that uh, they are running the best airport system anywhere. And, and that's exactly what, what happened. So we are responsible for obviously operating the airports, maintaining the airports, and investing in infrastructure and that's what keeps us uh, keeps us busy. Yes, and, and you are the chief executive officer who reports to a board of representatives that make up that are geographically represented, right? Exactly. Yeah, they're appointed for the most part. They're appointed by the governor, Rick King, who yes. you know, Eden is Prairie resident, Eden Prairie resident, chair of our commission, does a great job uh, managing the the commission. Uh, the majority are appointed by the governor. They have districts, uh, with the exception of two. Uh, two are appointed by the mayors, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, they each have an appointment. And then we also have four outstate representatives, uh, currently one from Rochester, one from uh, Duluth, one from Thief River Falls, and one from the St. Cloud area. So the, And that was added, I think it was about the mid-90s when they decided to expand the commission uh, from 11 to 15, uh, because they understood that uh, we're obviously influenced the entire state and frankly five state region when you want to look at it sure. as a whole when when you mention the foresight and setting up an actual independent commission to manage the airports would you are you saying that in like a Chicago or Milwaukee or I'm just thinking nearby that those are through the city or the county 
that operate solos, they typically don't see a separate commission uh, appointed to just manage that? There are a lot of examples of city and city and maybe even city county operated airports. Denver's a good example of that. Philadelphia's another example. Chicago, another example. And I've been I've been associated with both types of sure. formats. I've actually when I was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, we transitioned from a county airport to an airport authority, really because I believe that's the best model. Mm-hmm. It, it takes, I think, competing interests out of the arena and allows the airport just to really focus on the airport itself and what's best for the business of the airport and in, in ensuring that um, the right decisions are being made without overall political influence. But, but it's interesting because because all I really know really well is the airport here in Eden Prairie and the one in, in Minneapolis. And I guess I wouldn't think of it any other way. I think it would be odd if that was run by a department of the city of Minneapolis or, sure. you know, I know it's close to Bloomington, Richfield, but I, it's interesting. I don't even think in that regard. Yeah. When I was in St. Cloud uh, for five years, that, that was a city run airport. Now that airport has just recently transitioned to an authority too, after many years of trying to go there, but I reported to the city engineer. So okay. it's a, yeah. So different models, yeah. you know, I'm a firm believer that the airport authority or airport commission model is, is really the best for an airport. As long as you obviously collaborate and work together with the communities that, you know, your airports sure. are, are around your airports. And that's where, again, I think about there are some, I worked in the city of Hector, which had an airport where the person um, that I did work with that person um, in the city hall and the city operation. But, and maybe someone could think about that with Eden Prairie in terms of being, you know, a part of the city but I'm just when I think of the large, large airports, um, they're just th- things are happening throughout the country, and th- they're affected by so many different things. But um, yeah, what can you talk a little bit be- a little bit about reliever airports and how Flying Cloud fits into that system? How sure. that works? Yeah. Uh, so the way the MAC was set up is the Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport was really the the focus point for scheduled air service and scheduled cargo service. And the thought was we will have these reliever airports that help Minneapolis really focus on that activity and take some of the smaller activity, the general aviation activity, the flight training activity, the corporate activity, away from Minneapolis so that Minneapolis has has as much capacity as possible to accommodate air service, right, and cargo service. And so that's how it was set up. And, and frankly, it works really well. And I think a good testament of that was when we hosted the Super Bowl a yeah, few years ago. We had, we had 1,100 corporate aircraft descend upon the Twin Cities area. And Flying Cloud accommodated a number of those, as did Anoka, as did St. Paul. And so it, we, we would have had a very difficult time accommodating all of that activity at the Minneapolis airport without it impacting scheduled air service uh, and causing delays there. So, so that's how it works. And I think it works really, I think it works really well. And, uh, you know, Flying Cloud, as far as how they fit into the picture, is our busiest airport. 100 and, I think, you know, 40,000 operations, takeoffs and landings a year. Mm-hmm. That number used to be close to 200,000, one of the busiest airports in the country sure. um, back in the, I think, 2000 time frame. So Flying Cloud is a, is a very important piece of this, this system, and a very busy airport is the busiest airport in our system. Yeah, it's a good point because in terms of the operations here, so I've been here 11 years, and, and I think when I came, it was probably reaching kind of a lower point in in the operations in terms that are coming in and out. I know over time, like you talked about with the flight schools, um, the city representing the residents in the area, but also having a good relationship with you at Mac, or trying to balance the interests of the residents and um, the greater good of the airport. But you know, you'd have something come up like at uh, the the helicopter school where. Um, they'd have just a lot of operations in terms of training for helicopters. Sure. And we worked with you to come up with a plan to to reduce a number of, of takeoffs and landings, which, which you've been uh, very helpful in that regard. But my point was, you mentioned it was actually twice as busy 20 years ago than it is now, but it might be 50% more busy than it was 
10 years ago. Exactly. So it's interesting because people are kind of noticing you know, there's a lot more activity. It's actually not as much as it was 20 years ago, but um, it's picking up. And, yeah. And I think that's, you know, and that's one of the challenges. Obviously, our mission is uh, from the MAC is to promote uh, aviation throughout the seven county metro area and do all we can to build out the full potentials of aviation. But part of our mission also is to ensure that we're doing all we can from an uh, from an environmental standpoint to minimize the environmental impacts. And you know those two areas conflict at times, but there are things you can do. And I think you you mentioned a couple of good examples. And and it's uh, very important to us to work collaboratively with the communities that surround our, our airports. We want to be good neighbors. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're assets in communities is the way we view them, but at the same time, there's some downsides too, and we, we all have to work together on those things. Yeah, it's a balance. I mean, we will go on business visits and we'll talk to Cambria and C.H. Robinson and Optum and Starkey, and they'll talk about the presence of an airport. Is it, you know, It's really good for those large businesses, those Fortune 500 companies right. in Eden Prairie. They really appreciate that. And then you'll go to Night to Unite, and you'll hear from some residents that are saying, why, why are they allowed to fly at night? Right. Can, and, and again, it's, it's education in terms of the city, to, the city, not only the city really or MAC, but it's the FAA that says right. you can't restrict nighttime operations. But we have a partnership where we try to educate people, um, you know, different um, fixed base operators to talk to them about if you don't have to fly at night, please don't. Exactly, exactly, and th- and that's that's the critical element because of the the rules governing airports. You mentioned the FA and the funding that is received. We we can't we can't just close our airports down at a certain time and reopen them at another time. They have to be open uh, to promote interstate commerce and and uh, but there's things that you can work on that have been demonstrated right here um, at Flying Cloud to try to you know, help minimize some of those impacts. Yeah, and, and also, would you say that, you know, as time passes and newer planes are built, hopefully the newer planes are quieter as well? And that has been the trend, uh, both, uh, you know, in all of aviation. Minneapolis, you know, I remember when I first started working at Minneapolis, there were Stage 1 and Stage 2 aircraft, um, old Boeing 707s that just were extremely loud. And that has transitioned over time. We have stage three and stage four aircraft now that are much less noisy, and our noise contours have actually come in further towards the airport. The challenge with that, having been a noise guy in my background yeah, early right. on, we'll, and we're going to get to your background, but uh, you, you did start as a noise guy. Yeah, I, I mean the challenge with that is the evolution is so slow that people it's hard to notice. I mean, mm-hmm. if we were if we were to take and I told someone this at a community meeting once if we were to take the operation that we were experiencing back in 1985 and for one day operate that operation at the airport and then the next day transition to today you would notice the difference but because the evolution takes time uh, you don't notice it and you know people cycle through homes and new people move in and so it's um, it's different and it's just something we have to continually manage. That's true, and that's why I mentioned the number of operations that someone would say, I've lived here for 15 years, and I, it seems more activity, um, louder. And that may not necessarily be the case in terms of noise, um, but activity it might be. Um, so, yeah, it's, it is a balance. It's a constant uh, balance between, like you said, the environmental factors um, allowing for for the airport to succeed. And I don't want to get too uh, deep into Flying Cloud and the final agreement, but people do say, what do you see? What will what what do the next 10 years look like in, at Flying Cloud? And I'd like to kind of, because I know you're working on a long-range plan update, but w- what we tell people is the agreement that we made almost 20 years ago, um, we, we, can't, we plan on operating in general in, under those same parameters mm-hmm. for, for as long as we can see, not having I- additional extended runways that are suddenly going to bring in a passenger jet aircraft. That's just not really going to happen. Well, I, th- I think um, y- you're, you're right. We're working through a long-term plan, which we do every so often. The FAA requires us to do it every so so often, and and that process is happening right now. And so what I what I foresee 
is there is some additional room for development. We are, um, our hangar sites have been built up, those that we can accommodate right now. So there's some opportunity. We have a waiting list. And so we'll be talking more about that as we proceed through the long-term comp plan. As far as runway lengths, I mean, we're limited by the state legislature. Uh, we cannot build a runway longer than 5,000 feet at our reliever airports, and that won't change yeah. here. And so yeah. I, th- I think, um, but there are some there are some other topics in that long-term plan that we'll we'll continue to visit on and, and talk about um, from a development standpoint, and and we'll we'll work through it to, to determine what's best. Yeah, absolutely, and and more to come on that. But I think when you're limited to 5,000 feet, that me not being an aviation expert, it does tell me that it, it can tell you if you stay with that, there's just a certain type of airport you're always going right. to be. Exactly. Exactly. You're not going to see air carriers coming into the Flying no. Cloud Airport. No. Um, I want to talk, I do want to kind of trace your career a little bit and talk about a lot of the different places you've been and how you got to where you were because you have, I mean, you are, you have the chief executive position of, um, this organization that does so much. But before we get to that, um, COVID. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about how COVID affected your work? And, and I know you, for the position you're in, I think you've been in this position for six years, a little over six years. So COVID probably came a little bit halfway past um, your tenure here. It, it did. And I, and I tell people when I look at my roughly 36 years in the industry now, at, at a number of different airports. I always thought 9-11 was going to be the big speed bump. And we always, we always know in, in industry and even with what you're doing, Rick, that there's always going to be a reset in the economy every so often. And uh, so you, you kind of wait for it. You expect it. Um, but we, in our industry, we would never have imagined the depth of the impact that COVID had on us. I, I mean, if, if you were to tell me that... Uh, in in February of 2020, that you know our numbers were up eight percent uh, over 2019, February of 2019, when we set an all-time record coming off of 2019. That we would then in April be at only five percent of our traffic volume, or a 95 percent reduction. 95 95 percent reduction yeah. in April of, of 2020. I would never have believed that could possibly happen, but it did. And so, um, so from a financial standpoint, it was the most challenging time our organization had had ever experienced. Um, from a personnel standpoint, my, my the term I would use was just uncertainty. I mean, we had employees, sixty five percent of our workforce that had to be there at work to keep the airport open, to maintain runways a police and fire department that needed to be there. And those employees weren't quite sure what they were going to experience. You know, it was, this, was before, this was before vaccines. It was even, you know, I think right away before masks were required. So a lot of uncertainty, a lot of challenges. And frankly, I think that led to some tension in the organization. When we sent 35% of our employees home, the others, you know, looked and said, well, is that fair or, or not? And so as a as a CEO, it was an extremely challenging time. We were, yeah. we were integrating policies and procedures that we had never experienced before. And I tell my employees, I know some were not popular, and, but we were making the best decisions. We were taking a measured approach. And, you know, when I look back, I don't think we ever had to step back from a decision we made, which I, I give credit to my leadership team and the great work that they, that they did. And, uh, so it's just challenging financially, operationally, not knowing what airlines were going to do. And a, another example of this is typically airlines schedule their flights six months. You know, they prepare their schedule six months to a year in advance. They were scheduling two weeks in advance. Wow. I mean, that's how, that's how dynamic and cyclic it was. But uh, I hope we never have something like this uh, again. But I think the good, the, the good thing that came from it is um, we became stronger as an organization and you know it created some innovation and and there's always good things that come out of challenging times and i think we've experienced that sure and it's interesting because the the two different areas of travel that came out of this business travel leisure travel right 
And I think, you know, we notice with people having vacations that were delayed a year or two years, they couldn't wait to get to destinations, exactly. right? Starting in tw- late 2021, 20, now we're in 22. So I'm guessing that's, is that fully rebounded yet? Leisure traffic is fully rebounded okay. and, in fact, has been fully rebounded for uh, some time okay. here. I, you know, but I think what it tells you, uh, one, there was a pent-up demand, and and um, secondly, you know, it, it's when you think about travel, it's it's something that I think we all kind of take for granted, right? If we want to go somewhere, we just go, whether you drive your car somewhere or, or um, fly somewhere. And all of a sudden when that's restricted or taken away, you know, and international was impossible almost to travel because of all the different restrictions and things which, yeah. which made it very difficult. But when that's taken away, I think then people really appreciate it that much more. And I think that's what we saw with the leisure travel and how quickly that rebounded. People want to people want to interact personally. And, um, you know, the virtual thing worked for a while, mm-hmm. right? That was kind of new and exciting. But people got tired of that, I mm-hmm. think. And, um, and so travel is important. Well, the virtual part, so that's from a business perspective, right? And here we are in the fall of 22, people still kind of adapting and figuring out how they're going to adapt to hybrid work or what does hybrid work look like. Um, so what does that mean for business travel? I mean, how is that going right now then? I think that's the big question. You know, that's been the question for the last couple of years. How is COVID going to impact, ultimately impact business travel? Is it going to be, you know, is it going to impact overall business travel by 5 or 10%? Those are the numbers that I've kind of seen thrown out there. I don't think we quite know yet. We know there's going to be, definitely, there is an impact because when you can, when, when you can communicate and conduct business virtually, you know, you can get a lot of things done there. But I do also think that an example of someone who's in, you know, sales or business development, if your competitor is, is flying out to meet someone, I can guarantee you'll probably be flying out to do the same thing eventually as well. Right now, the we're at about 80% recovery. We've been bouncing around between 75 and 80%. The main reason for that is Delta has actually pulled back their operation, their network nationwide. If you recall back in May and June when all of the issues were happening with canceled flights yeah. and the airlines were really getting beat up about uh, not being reliable, uh, to his credit, Ed Bastian, the CEO of Delta, mm-hmm. said, we're not meeting the service levels that Delta is accustomed to meeting. We're going to pull back that schedule, and we're going to do it until until we can um, perform. And that's what they did. And Delta will be bringing back their schedule 100% um, either by the end of this year or first part of next year. So I think we'll, we'll next year we'll get a true sense of really what that ultimate impact is going to be. Interesting that five to ten percent to me doesn't seem. I mean, it might be a lot in raw dollars, but as a percent of business travel reduction, that doesn't seem major. I don't. I don't think it. I don't think it will be. I mean, that's that's my my feeling, but but we'll see. I mean, it's you know, for the airline, the airlines are going to work hard, continue to work hard on that business travel uh, traveler because that's where their revenue comes from, and. Um, they will they will be very competitive i think moving forward to ensure that they get that travel back and you know the international piece as well is very important to them europe has come back the demand for europe is is more i think than they've ever seen in fact delta is continuing their summer europe schedule into fall because the demand is there the big question mark uh international still asia and we were able to um, uh, recoup our soul flight through delta just a couple of weeks ago, and um, the the one remaining flight that we're still working on is Haneda, and and so there's some question marks on exactly when that will return. That that whole relationship is interesting to me now. So I'm hearing you talk about uh, obviously Delta's the um, it's a hub, Minneapolis, b- b- large carrier there. So you spend time talking to them about and maybe some influencing on destinations that you'd like to see come out of Minneapolis and where they come and go. And, you know, that's interesting. Like, do you spend time 
kind of managing that whole piece with a carrier? How does that work? We are um, we're very aggressive from an air service development standpoint, and the way it, the way it works is I have an air service development person who's in charge of that, and they go out and there's air service development conferences that are held around the country, and he goes out and he meets uh, with airlines and um, talks about opportunities. Now, the other really important piece of that is engaging the business community, and we've done something really uh, neat here in the Twin Cities area where we have a partnership with Greater MSP, the Regional Economic Development uh, Group, uh, to bring CEOs and travel um, individuals as part of those businesses together and find out, we survey them, and we say, we know where you're going today. We've got that information. What we need to know is where you are planning to go in the next two to three years. We compile that data, and then we bring it to airlines like Delta or American or United or Southwest, and we say, these are opportunities that we think you should take a look at. And it's been very successful. It's um, it's uh, one of the reasons we were able to get um, Seoul service to Incheon Airport in Seoul, South Korea. It was a reason we got Dublin service a few years ago. And so that information is extremely valuable, be- again, because it's coming from the business community and the airlines want to know. They want to know because they, I mean, it's almost like they'd be guessing where future destinations would be if they don't, if they're not going there now. Are they looking at, you know, how often they're coming out of New York, Atlanta, Chicago, and assuming we're all going to connect out of there? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's and the important part of air service development here is the number of Fortune 500 companies we okay. have in this demographic area. And it's a, it's a strong business market. We will, you know, hopefully always be a strong business market, but it's a critical hub for Delta, and they want to continue to build and grow this hub as much as they possibly can to be successful. Well, in terms of um, success, Brian, I think, you know, we recently heard that the MSP airport was ranked highest in passenger satisfaction among the larger airports, you know, more so than some on the West Coast and JFK in New York, Dallas. Um, That's awesome. And what do you attribute to that? Because I think that's a big deal. I think, I think a few different things. One, I think our culture here in the in the upper Midwest, you know, everyone talks about MSP nice. Is it is it is it real? I think it is real, and I think that that's reflective in the service that um, you know our customers receive as they're coming and going through the through the airport. The other one of the other um, elements is we we are just we're focused on it. We are focused on customer service. That is always a priority of mine. And, and, you know, I think the airport in- industry has actually changed um, somewhat to focus more on that customer experience. My feeling is we're like a hospitality organization, and we want people, uh, as they're coming through our facility, to have the services and the amenities that they need to feel comfortable, to feel happy, not to be stressed. And um, we, try to, we try to provide that. The third element to our success is something really unique to us, and that's something called our Airport Foundation. It is a group of volunteers. We have over 400 volunteers. Many are retired individuals that still want to interact with people that come and show up to the airport and man our information booths. They walk around. We have an animal ambassador program. We have a um, arts and culture and performance program that just really reflects the sense of place and uh, the personal touch that we want to provide. And I, and I think that's very reflective, along with investments we've made in restrooms and other capital improvements to really um, heighten or elevate that passenger experience. Yeah, I was going to say from my personal experience, and we talked about this before we, we started recording about you know coming to the airport 20 years ago, and there really weren't any familiar stores, shops, restaurants, places that that I know from the area. And there's a ton of that now. And people maybe start taking that for granted in terms of all the different um, unique restaurants that are in the area are, are in that airport. But that's really only been the last 10, 15 years, at least that I can remember. 
going there. So I think that, and it keep, keeps growing, right? Right. With some of the expansions down the concourses. But I mean, that's got to play into that. You can spend the day there. You're absolutely right. I think airports used to have a, you know, a concession called airport food and beverage where you could get a cold sandwich and maybe warm it up in a, in a, oven or microwave and then get a horrible cup of coffee right that was that was kind of the the trend it has changed it has changed all around sense of place and meaning when individuals come through this airport for the first time i want them to get a sense of what the twin cities region and the state is all about and we have that opportunity and that's about first impressions because you never know who that individual may be and what their interest could be. They may be as someone that is looking at moving a business here or expanding a business or investing. And that first impression is vitally important. And that's how we that's how we treat passengers and what we're doing there. You just never know um, what it can evolve to. I remember telling a friend that I, I said, I think the the f- like the fifth or sixth best bookstore in the metro is in the airport. That's great. You know, in terms yeah. of that's you know, my experience there. But there's a lot of good bookstores, but like, they're in sure. like my top five or ten. That's great. Um, what what would you what would you say in your time has probably been your biggest accomplishment? Well, I I think a, a few different things. When I look back at my career, it, it was it was great. I left the I left here after the first time I had started here at. Minneapolis to go out and be involved in the new Denver International Airport, first major hub airport to be built since Dallas-Fort Worth back in 1978. So it was just great being involved in that. But I think when I look at other big accomplishments, when I was in Duluth, we built a whole new terminal. And my goal in building that roughly 80 or $90 million terminal was to not tap into any local taxpayer dollars. And I was successful in doing that. I looked. I think I had 13 different funding sources. I looked under every rock, and Duluth has a beautiful new terminal now um, that will satisfy their needs for many years to come. When I was in Grand Rapids, we uh, initiated a um, capital, a private capital investment project to really help us invest. We needed to do expand the terminal, and we didn't have enough money in the airport coffers to do it. And so we went out to the business community and asked them if they would invest in it, and, and they did. And so that was neat. And then the final thing is the what we call our operational improvements program here at uh, Minneapolis, where we've expanded uh, the ticketing and baggage levels. Uh, we've completely transformed the space, and it's just really a nice improvement. Now, the, the challenge is when you make improvements in certain areas, other areas start to look start to, yeah. a look a little bit differently. And so now we're moving into the concourses, but it's fun stuff. I like the projects that people can experience and touch and feel, not to say a runway isn't a very right. improved, important yeah. project, but the ones where people just can experience are the ones that are really gratifying. That's true. I mean, you mentioned bathrooms earlier. I mean, that there's been a lot of work done in the bathrooms there, and that's that can be a big deal. Yeah. You know, if you're going to spend quite a bit of time there. So you did. You kind of jumped around a little bit. You mentioned you were in Denver when the when the big new airport was built, and I and I've been out to that new airport as well, and Duluth and Grand Rapids. But do do you tell people uh, back at Mac that? Um, there's room for everybody in the organization because your start was as an intern, right? Absolutely. You, yeah. You're, the very beginning for you was an intern. I was an intern here. I got my foot in the door. I, I grew up in Lakeville, just down the road, at, when Lakeville had one high school, obviously, so that uh, dates myself <laughs> a little bit. But uh, Well, they only added the third in the last decade, <laughs> Brian. I've, only right. been, I've been here in the state for 26 years, so you have to tell me what year they added the second school in Lakeville. Boy, I'm... Roughly. Oh, boy. It had to be nine. No, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been nine. It had to be late 90s. Late 90s was the second maybe. one? Okay. Because the there third. Was, there was one high school right. when I was yeah. uh, in, in school. But but anyhow, so um, started as an intern here at the, at the MAC and got my foot in the door and then came back and was able to um, 
after finishing uh, school, went to the through the aviation program in St. Cloud, came back and and was able to get on full time. Well, it was part time. It was five bucks an hour, no benefits, to get my foot back in the door. And so I did that. Worked here for four years, as you mentioned, in the noise area, and then went out to Denver for five or six years uh, through the building of that new airport. Experienced the overnight move from the old airport, Stapleton, to Denver. But I really wanted to be an airport uh, director, so I went uh, from there. I call it my second internship because it was almost like you know, cutting my pay in half and going to be an airport manager in Aberdeen, South Dakota. Uh, and then went to St. Cloud for five years to Duluth for 10 and then uh, over to Grand Rapids, Michigan for four years. And then my predecessor, Jeff Hamill, retired after 39 years in the seat and uh, threw my hat in the ring and they invited me back. Yeah, that's interesting that, um, you know, if you had stayed in Denver, it's a pretty large airport, I suppose it could have taken a while to move up within that system. But you said, hey, um, that's something I'd like to aspire to, but I'm going to go to the smaller airport and be the the big fish in the small pond. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, there's there's different ways to do it. I mean, you're right. I could have stayed here as well. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, worked around, but I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I mean, I, I just think the experience, the networks you develop, uh, you've, I know you've uh, moved to different communities mm-hmm. as, as well, Rick, and the networks you develop, and uh, it's just great experiences along yeah. the way. Yeah, no, that's interesting. What would you say is probably the biggest issue you're currently facing? I, I, think, I think there's a couple. I, one... During COVID, we actually had to push back about $300 million in what was scheduled capital investments. And so catching that up is a big challenge. And I think there's, you know, there's $114 billion in needs, of, uh, you know, airports across the U.S. over the next five years. And, and we have a lot of needs. And it's, it's coming up with ways to fund those needs because we do not take in taxpayer dollars. Uh, we and we're not going to get into that, uh, and so it's you know it's using your revenue and finding other funding sources to help pay for those improvements that are that are needed. So I, I, that's a big one. The second one that the entire industry is faced with right now is labor and labor shortage. Uh, we are we are short, I think, five or six hundred employees throughout the airport. When you look at you know, between us, the TSA, the airlines, the concessionaires, and we need employees out there. And, um, and that has been a big disruptor uh, with trying to keep concessionaries open, serving the public. And I, I, I will say TSA and the airlines have done a great job as a, have our concessionaires, but that'll continue, I think, to be an issue for us. So I would sure. say those are the two biggest challenges. Yeah, I think the obviously the labor issue is not unique to you. It's a national issue. Hits every industry. But, um, yeah, it's interesting. I think we were talking earlier about if cities and counties kind of run and manage airports, that probably falls into their, their tax structure right. and system. So Exactly. Yeah, it's another benefit that the airport's kind of paying for itself, mm-hmm. funding itself. Um, I asked you about you know, flying cloud and where we see that going. And you talked about the, the long range plan. How about bigger picture about Mac itself and overall aviation, just crystal ball, 10 years, 15 years from now. Um, maybe not a lot doesn't change. I don't know. Maybe there's new technology. I'm not sure, but what, what is, what does it all look like 10, 15 years from now? Well, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of focus on sustainability, obviously across the, the globe and airlines have made some pretty lofty goals around being sustainable things like sustainable aviation fuels uh, there's a lot of focus on autonomous types of vehicles both on ground vehicles and in the air um, so I think I think those innovations are really going to help determine the pace of aviation and the change in aviation over the over the next uh, 10 to, f- to 15 years. It's going to be interesting. I mean, one of our big questions, uh, we've got a sustainability plan with some, I think, pretty lofty goals on it. One of the big questions, and we'd like to electrify things. We've talked about electrifying boilers. One of the big questions we have, though, is can our can Excel Energy keep up 
with the demand. And so uh, I recently had the chance to meet with the CEO of Excel Energy. We had a very good conversation uh, about that. And and our other concern is to ins- ensure, you know, our rates remain competitive through, throughout that. And so, um, so we have to work collaboratively with them to ensure that uh, our goals are realistic and, and we're, uh, you know, uh, moving in the right direction at the right pace. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, as our city, we f- we feel the same way. Sustainability is, you know, the future. Trying to you know, eventually have you know an all electric fleet here in the city, and and if you're doing that throughout the state and region, can can Excel handle all that? Right. You know, they say we're working our way up to handle that. If everyone in their home, uh, business operations, um, electrify at that rate, um, we want to be able to have a reliable source. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, personally, this is these are questions I like to ask the the head of Mac. Such things as, what's your favorite um, travel destination, like worldwide? What's your favorite one? Well, I I think Paris is a big. Uh, my wife and I have had a chance to go to uh, Paris a, a few occasions. So that's one of our favorites, and we've we've actually uh, traveled globally a little bit. You know, we've been to the Middle East, we've been to some other pretty cool destinations, but Paris kind of sticks out, I, I think. Like if you could, like this weekend, you just you get to fly somewhere, you get to go, and it would yeah. probably be Paris is what you would choose. Yeah, possibly. I think that in, you know, I'll tell you the place that we grew up going to, or I grew up going to, was Sanibel and Captiva Island in the United States. Yeah, which has been devastated yeah. now, which is just horrifying. But um, you know, when I look at um, when I look at uh, Within the U.S., those are destinations we like, along with Hawaii. We've grown accustomed to going to Hawaii the last few years and, and really like it. From a local standpoint, uh, Crane Lake is my place. Okay. I don't know if you know where that is. It's up towards the Minnesota-Canadian border. but uh, Minnesota-Canadian there. border to yeah, the Voyagers, central, uh, east, west, yeah, Voyager. It's, it's Voyager's National Park area. Got it. And so we love going up there. It's my. Uh, it's definitely my uh, retreat. Uh, I love to fish, and uh, and I love winter, too. And so we actually go up there in the winter when it's 20 or 30 below zeros at times and embrace it. Embrace it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I've I've um, I haven't been to Paris. I haven't been to Hawaii, but I have been to Sanibel Captiva a few times. Yeah. It's just terrible. I mean, yeah. it, it, I mean, it's there's so many people from Minnesota that um, spend a lot of their exactly. time down there, right? And uh, yeah, it's awful. It's it just really awful. Is. Yeah. Um, what what was your uh, worst flight experience? Well, prob- <laughs> probably, and I haven't had many at, at all. I, you, you know. Uh, I like to be positive about the environment, but the, there's one. Ask. There is one memorable one. I was actually when I was in Duluth, we had we were able to get United Airlines to operate up there, and um, they were they were flying regional jets in and out of there, and so I would use the service as much as possible to support it. And I had a trip. I was coming back from somewhere, connecting through Chicago, and there was a blizzard going on in in Duluth. And I remember calling my wife, and she said, "She said they're, they're, the flight's got to be canceled, right?" And I said, "I don't know. It's it, you know, it looks like they're still going." Well, they boarded the aircraft. We took off, and and the winds were forty miles an hour, blizzard conditions, no doubt. And and they were shooting the approach, and uh, it was a rough ride. They went around. I think they sh- tried to shoot it three times. And I was actually in that condition. I was glad they didn't try to land because I was, as a pilot too. It's like I, I don't know about this. And and we actually, after the third time, we flew back to Chicago, which I was happy. Which, which you wouldn't be happy for. You want to be home, but in this case, I was happy. They put me up in a hotel and we flew home. But it would have been better if it, better if they just never tried. Exactly. If you just stayed yeah, there the exactly. entire time. No, I, 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 I say I feel the same way that my percentage of. Um, Difficult experiences are, are very small, but it happens. Luggage, right. luggage gets lost. You're stuck on a on a runway sometimes or a tarmac. But right, um, no, actually, every plane I've been on landed where it was supposed to eventually. But everyone's got to have one story. Um, Brian, what would you say? Um, talking to friends, family, and peers, what would they say you're best known for? What's uh, what's something they would say about you? I, you know, I grew up playing hockey, football, b- 
baseball. I, I, I'm act. I like to be active. So I think I would be best known for. I enjoy being active. I enjoy the outdoors, and and so I think that's probably from an activity standpoint, that's what I'd be known for. But I, I think from a personality standpoint, that I'm open. I'm honest. I'm straightforward. Uh, you know, for me, whether it's uh, personal or business, it's about um, developing relationships and trusting relationships. And I think that's how you can be successful. And, and I think that's really important to me. You have to you have to be able to trust the people you're working with to be able to perform effectively and and try to create win-win situations. And so I think that's what people would say about me. That's, that's excellent to hear. When it comes to the, the sports then, so were you on that? Were you playing for that one Lakeville High School, all those sports way back when? Were you... I was. Were you, really? Yeah, I was. Yeah. In, uh, I think I gave up three base, sport I, athletes. I actually, I think I gave up baseball when I was in tenth uh, grade because I wanted to focus more on hockey and football, and I wanted my my springs off a little bit more. So I ended up um, more focusing on. Uh, well, I mean, Lakeville's like a football, basketball um, powerhouse. I don't know how they are as a hockey team. I'm not sure. Yeah, they, they well, I mean, but you got, got to, it all started. Doing well. But Let's yeah, yeah, we weren't we weren't the powerhouse back then. I'll say yeah. that. But we, we 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 competed well. I I think and had a few good uh, few good years. Well, it's interesting. I think both our cities have kind of grown at roughly the same rate. So probably when you know you were going to school there was probably Lakeville was probably a city of fifteen thousand twenty thousand people. If if, not, if, if that, that maybe which maybe, is maybe ten to ten thousand, which is yeah. what Eden Prairie was. Right. Um. You know, at that same time too two fast growing cities in the eighties and nineties and Lakeville still got room to develop. We're almost done, but, yeah. but yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. It's a I just want to make sure, you know, anybody listening out there is going to remember. Yeah. I remember Rick's from Lakeville. <laughs> just trying to bring I, that out. I remember when Lakeville had, had a population, the sign was 2,500 people. I mean, that again, dates me quite a ways, but uh, I do remember that. What would be something that, um, most people haven't done one thing most people haven't done but you've done i i think i have a good answer for that and and uh when i was in duluth we were duluth hosted air shows and there was a promoter that did a great job and i received a call from him one day and he said i've got this great opportunity for you and i said what is it he said it's a trip to an aircraft carrier and so i said okay when is it he said it's he gave me the date, and it's like, okay. And so he said, this is who you have to call at the Navy. So I called this person at the Navy, and I said, I said, um, this sounds like a great trip. I want to go, but do you have any other dates? And she says, well, why are you asking about any other dates? And I said, because it's my wife and I's 20-year anniversary. And so the trip the trip was to an aircraft carrier, and my wife, you know, it was me, and it, and it didn't go over very well when I told Tracy about <laughs> yeah. this opportunity yeah. I had. And so yeah. I called the woman back and, and said, do you have any other opportunities? And she said, she said, well, what's the issue? And I told her, and she said, bring your wife with. So I called Tracy and I said, we're going, we're flying out on an aircraft carrier on a COD, which is a cargo onboard delivery aircraft. We're going to catch the hook and we're going to be catapulted off. This is my wife who doesn't really like to fly. <laughs> that changed her perception of flying to see those young kids yeah. flying those aircraft and operating in that fashion. And we get, we get to do tours and really see the professionals at work in uh, protecting our country out yeah. there. We were 200 miles off the coast of Jacksonville, and it will be an experience that I will never, ever forget. It That's was unbelievable. Neat. That's a neat story. That's good. And a good, I mean, that that's an anniversary that you remember. Absolutely. I mean, you can go out and have a really good dinner <laughs> and, and go to a nice place, see a show, but but she's going to remember that, too. Yeah. yeah. What, what we'll remember is at night, we, they couldn't put us together in a room. We had to be in separate. But they were testing the catapult at night, which happened to be right above our room. So we didn't get a lot of sleep because wow. of that. But it was a really cool nah, experience. That's a neat experience. Uh, Brian, I, wrapping up, I just I want to thank you for, for coming on the podcast and sharing your background, talking about Mac. Um, we do. We value our relationship with you. 
and I appreciate you being a part of the podcast. Are there any parting words that you want to share with us before we sign off? Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity, and and I just want to say on behalf of the Airports Commission, we appreciate the the relationship that we share with the City of Eden Prairie, with you, Rick, and uh, really all all we've we've accomplished some really good things over the years, and we look forward to continuing that trend as we move forward. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Yeah, no, thank you, Brian.